Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the September 2021 RSM VAT webinar. Over the next hour, we'll give you an update on the most important VAT developments that have appeared during the last three months. And we'll also take a look at some further developments that are on the way. I'm Sarah Halstead. I'm an Associate Director and RSM's National Technical Officer for VAT. And presenting with me today are VAT partners Jim Burberry, who's from the Edinburgh office, and Peter Williams from RSM's Birmingham office. Now, we will be taking questions, so if you'd like to ask us anything about today's topics, please type your question uh, into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. If you can't see a Q&A box, click on the three dots button that's at the bottom of the screen and then click on the Q&A button and that should bring it up. Um, we will answer either towards the end of the presentation in our Q&A segment or we'll pick them up with you individually by email afterwards if there isn't time to get to all the queries. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and we're sending out the recording and a copy of the slides to you by email in the next day or so. Okay, so um, this is today's agenda. Firstly, Jim will cover the recent Court of Appeal decision in Royal Opera House, which is important for organisations that are affected by partial exemption. Then Peter will provide an update on COVID-related VAT issues, including upcoming changes to the temporary reduced rate uh, VAT rate for hospitality and leisure. And then Pete will also look at how it's going so far with the EU's new import one-stop shop, which has proved to be the key issue for UK businesses from the EU's e-commerce VAT changes that took effect on the 1st of July this year. And finally, I'll be bringing you up to speed with the latest from HMRC on its policy related to the VAT treatment of early termination fees and compensation payments. And then finally, we'll uh, have a look at some of your questions. So I will now hand you over to uh, Jim Burberry to talk about the Royal Opera House case. So over to you, Jim. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. If we have the next slide, please. In this session, I wanted to take us, uh, have a look at the recovery of VAT as input tax, uh, something I know is of interest to us all. Specifically, as regards our understanding of the VAT recovery rules in relation to the direct and immediate links between VAT bearing costs to supplies and activities. And to do so in the first instance by reference to the Court of Appeal decision in the Royal Opera, Royal Opera House case. We'll take a look at the background to the case, what the issue is, who's affected, and how RSM can help. Next slide, please. By way of background, the Royal Opera House is a charitable company limited by guarantee. It makes both VAT exempt supplies of cultural services and a number of taxable supplies such as catering, programme sales, bar and retail and specific commercial sponsorship. It is therefore treated as being partially exempt for VAT purposes. The Royal Opera House made a claim to HMRC to recover VAT as input tax of about £532,000 associated with the costs of staging productions at the Opera House between June 2011 and August 2012, the so-called production costs. HMRC denied the claim, which set in train a series of litigation hearings at the First Tier Tribunal, the Upper Tribunal, and eventually the Court of Appeal. Next slide, please. The Royal Opera House claimed that due to the link to both exempt and taxable supplies, the input tax associated with the production costs is residual input tax and recoverable in full or in part according to the adopted part exemption method. The Court of Appeal has decided that this is the incorrect analysis, therefore the claim was denied. Originally, the first tier tribunal decided that there was a direct and immediate link between the production costs and the taxable catering supplies of the Royal Opera House in its bars and restaurants, sales of ice cream, shop including online sales of recordings of Royal Opera Productions and production specific commercial venue hire. Thus the VAT was recoverable in accordance with the past exemption method. HMRC disagreed and took an appeal to the Upper Tribunal and won. The Upper Tribunal held HMRC's appeal on the basis that there were two separate supplies which operated in parallel to which the production costs were linked. The production costs were directly and immediately linked to the performances for which the tickets were sold 
Whilst there was an indirect link economically between the production costs and the catering supplies, there was not enough for there to be a direct and immediate link. The parties agreed that a but-for relationship test was not sufficient to establish the link. The so-called but-for test being where a taxable supply would not have been made but for the existence of an exempt supply. The Upper Tribunal further held that expressing this test in economic terms was not sufficient to create a direct and immediate link. The Royal Uprise appealed to the Upper Tribunal's decision to the Court of Appeal. In its decision issued in June, the Court of Appeal has now upheld the earlier decision of the Upper Tribunal that there was not a direct and immediate link as the production costs were not a cost component of the catering or bar income. Whilst it was clear that there was an indirect link and that the Royal Opera House may be economically dependent on both performances and catering operating together, this was not sufficient to enable additional VAT recovery in relation to the production costs. This decision is contrary to an earlier upper tier decision in respect of the North of England Zoological Society, aka Chester Zoo, in respect of economic links. In its student decision, the Court of Appeal said the fact that the production costs enabled the Royal Opera House to make the catering supplies by attracting customers who bought tickets to the opera or ballet to partake of the catering supplies is not sufficient to establish a direct and immediate link. Next slide, please. So who's affected by this decision? Well, potentially all but registered entities are affected by this decision, particularly those who ordinarily cannot recover all the VAT they incur. For instance, ranging from holding companies, financial services institutions, health and education bodies through to charities. For us all, the key to navigating the VAT recovery maze is that there must be a direct and immediate link from cost to supply. You need to show that the expenditure is a cost component of are directly consumed in the delivery of a supply? If the answer is yes, it is, then the VAT recovery status will be determined by reference to the VAT liability of that supply. As a result of the Royal Opera House case, specifically, we anticipate that HMRC will be looking to revisit how partial exemption and business non-business methods have been applied in practice to ensure that the correct approach to determine VAT recovery has indeed been taken. Due to the complexities of this aspect of the VAT legislation and what, on the face of it, appear to be contradicted decisions in the courts, it is likely that we'll still see a number of disputes with HMRC. Moreover, if you're operating under the cultural exemption for VAT and have been including catering, bar or retail income in your past exemption calculations for exhibitions or productions, now would seem an appropriate time to review your input tax deduction in light of this case. Even if you operate a past exemption method, it can still be overridden if differences in calculations are substantial. Indeed, COVID may also have affected turnover ratios due to past exemption methods, creating further anomalies. So by reference to the Royal Opera House decision, only those supplies where there's a direct and immediate link should be taken into consideration when determining the value of that to be recovered. Next slide, please. By way of an example, in this slide, in the case of Royal Opera House, the only, only those supplies in the circle where there's a direct and immediate link should be taken into consideration when determining the value of VAT be recovered in relation to production costs. Next slide, please. Other previous VAT cases which appeared to contradict each other may now make more sense. In the University of Cambridge ECG case, HMRC successfully argued that the investment manager fees were wholly consumed in delivering the non-business investment activities and none of the associated VAT costs were eligible for recovery. The fact that the investments generated income that in turn was used to support the university's broader activities was seen to be an indirect link rather than a direct link and not sufficient to enable recovery of any VAT incurred. If the expenditure is not a cost component of or directly linked to a supply, and you need to ask what the expenditure has enabled you to do. The VAT recovery status will then be determined based on that activity. For example, in the ECG case of Sveda, the tax authorities had tried to argue that the expenditure incurred on constructing a recreational path was linked to a non-business supply, namely the free use of the path. The ECG held that the free use of the path was not an activity or a supply in and of itself, but that there was a direct link between the costs of constructing the path and future vatable sales, in this case, in the online on-site shop. Therefore, Spader was entitled to recover VAT on the costs of building the path. 
Similarly, in the UK Supreme Court case of Frank Smart, it held that the purchase of the single farm payment units and the subsequent subsidies that the farm was entitled to receive were not separate transactions. There was a direct and immediate link between the purchase of the single farm payment units and the deployment of the net proceeds of the subsidies in subsequent economic, battable activities, so that was recoverable on their purchase. In both these cases, the expenditure incurred was not a cost component directly linked to a supply and activity, rather it was a cost that enabled the business to make taxable supplies. So if there is a direct and immediate link between cost and supply, then that's what is determined the right to that recovery. If there's no direct and immediate link to a supply and activity, then you need to understand what the cost has enabled you to do, and it is this that will then determine if that is eligible for recovery. Next slide, please. I think it's fair to say that we were not surprised by the Court of Appeals decision and feel it's broadly correct. However, we haven't yet seen it used in practice by HMRC and of course we wait to see how HMRC will respond. The Court of Appeals decision means that for businesses that businesses face a strict interpretation of the requirement for a direct and immediate link in order to recover input tax and those that rely on the but-for test to establish that recovery will need to consider their position. Indeed, we expect that some charities will rely upon the 2015 decision in the case of Chester Zoo. However, the upper tribunal in the Royal Opera House case that said that Chester Zoo was decided on its own facts based on the ECG case law in place at that time. It is not clear, therefore, at the moment how safe those entities are that are relying on the Chester Zoo decision to support their input tax recovery. We do understand that zoos, theatres and like with cultural activities are generally aware of the case and most have either provided for the VAT at risk or did not claim the VAT in the first place. However, there will be some cultural bodies out there who are vulnerable to an HMRC challenge and will need to consider the impact of Royal Opera House on their partial exemption. For instance, HMRC may seek to apply the partial exemption standard method override or perhaps withdraw approval for the use of a standard of a partial exemption special method if it feels that the current partial exemption method does not produce a fair and reasonable result. And as we know, VAT is a self-assessed tax, so any failure to apply the override or update the past exemption method could result in HMRC seeking to issue a four-year assessment. Next slide, please. So how can ISM help? I'm sure you'll agree that VAT recovery is an evergreen and somewhat litigious VAT issue, and now more than ever it is in the spotlight when we consider the number of decisions issued by the courts and in light of the impact of COVID distortions affecting VAT recovery rates. So now is a good time for you to actively review your VAT recovery position. To that end, for example, we're working with our clients to review their VAT recovery, decision-making processes, and their partial exemption and business or business apportionment methods. Are they fit for purpose before, during and after COVID and in light of this most recent litigation? Also, we can help you assess if your approach to VAT recovery is sustainable. If it's not, we can assist in quantifying the impact and help you devise an alternative methodology that will meet HMRC's fair and reasonable test and it's overly prudent. If it is, we can assess the financial impact and if applicable help to devise an alternative approach to VAT recovery. And of course, we can assist you with any inquiries from HMRC. Thank you very much. I'll now hand you on to Pete. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and a warm welcome to you. Um, I'm going to be covering, first of all, a few of the recent changes to um, the COVID-19 related reliefs that have been introduced by HMRC since the pandemic started, um, probably from March 2020 onwards. Some of these reliefs have now ended or are coming to an end, and some of the existing reliefs are going to change significantly. Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, you'll all no doubt remember HMRC's general VAT deferral. Um, that was introduced in 2020 that allowed businesses to de defer any VAT payments due to HMRC between the 10th, 20th of March and the 30th of June 2020. Over half a million businesses deferred their VAT payments and over 25% of VAT registered businesses that were permitted to delay their VAT payments as a result of the pandemic still owe HMRC the tax that's being deferred. I think the latest figure I saw from the Treasury was well over two billion of outstanding VAT that's still owed to HMRC. Businesses were then given the option of paying back the VAT in full by the 31st of March 2021, or instead join an online deferral scheme by the 21st of June 
to spread repayments of the deferred VAT over smaller interest-free instalments. And whilst the deferral scheme is now closed, businesses are still able to agree separate time to pay arrangements with HMRC if they're still in difficulty. Next slide, please, Sarah. I think, however, whilst HMRC have taken a fairly light touch approach to date to collecting tax debts from businesses, that approach may be about to change. And that's because HMRC have published a policy paper setting out its approach to recovering tax debts from businesses adversely affected by the pandemic. The policy covers all taxes and not just VAT. In the policy paper, HMRC say that they are restarting their debt collection work from September and will be contacting businesses that have fallen behind with their tax or with their repayments if they've been agreed. Whilst HMRC say that it will at all times take an understanding and supportive approach to businesses with debts, there does seem now to be a shift in their stance. As they say in the statement, well, whilst, whilst they will do everything possible to help businesses with temporary cash flow issues, where they think there is little chance of recovery then from September 2021, if customers um, or businesses are unwilling to discuss a payment plan, or they ignore attempts from HMRC to contact them, then HMRC will start the process of collecting the debt using its enforcement powers. Over the last 18 months or so, I think most people would agree HMRC have been very, very accommodating towards businesses in financial trouble due to COVID. But the statement does seem to indicate that light touch era might be coming to an end. HMRC do say they'll try and engage with non-payers and offer short-term deferral of debts in some cases. But I think the main takeaway message is that HMRC will be easing back into its debt recovery approach from September from this month. So businesses need to ensure that if they do get into trouble, and we've had lots of clients that signed up to the, um, the, deferrals, the deferral repayment scheme to pay their VAT back in instalments that are now seeking to kind of renegotiate that because of well, lots of reasons, but supply chain a lot of the time. Those businesses, they need to start communicating with HMRC at the earliest opportunity if they're struggling to make their repayments. Next slide, please, Sarah. One of the other big changes that HMRC really uh, introduced as a result of the pandemic, um, probably the headline relief, was the reduced 5% rate for the hospitality holiday accommodation and attraction sector. Um, the 5% rate was originally introduced on the 8th of July, 2020, and applied to certain supplies in the hospitality sector made between the 15th of July, 2020, and the 31st of March, 2021. But in this year's budget, the reduced rate was then extended to the 30th of September, 2020, 2021, at the end of this month, from which a new reduced rate of 12.5% was announced, and that will apply from the 1st of October this year until the 31st of March next year. This means that if they haven't already started, businesses need to start preparing for a new rate change in this sector, which will be introduced in just over a week's time. This will include adapting prices, accounting systems, online booking engines, EPOS systems, till receipt sales invoices to reflect the new rate and ensure the correct amount of VAT is charged to customers and declared to HMRC. It used to be that that practitioners, we waited in vain for VAT rate changes to be announced in budgets because, you know, at one time they were, they were fairly infrequent, fairly rare, where now they seem to be coming along like buses. So, and it's easy to become blasé about them, but businesses in this sector particularly shouldn't underestimate the complexity that is sometimes involved when a rate change occurs. Next slide, please, Sarah. To demonstrate how complicated it can be um, for the unprepared, we're just going to take a look at one aspect of the reduced rate and in, in the restaurant and catering sector. And it's an issue we've, we've come across increasingly in, in client scenarios in the last few months. Um, 
the complexity arises because the reduced rate for takeaway food doesn't change supplies of coal takeaway takeaway food which still retained or still retain their pre rate change VAT treatment. So for example, coal takeaway food such as um, confectionery, snacks, crisps, retain their previous 20% treatment, not impacted by the reduced rate. Similarly, takeaway coal beverages are still at 20%. Whereas coal takeaway sandwiches and salads, still 0%, not impacted by the reduced rate takeaway milkshakes and milk drinks also not impacted by the reduced rate still at zero percent next slide please Sarah so just to show the additional complexity to, that can arise from this issue where a takeaway fast food outlet or restaurant for example sells a takeaway meal in the form of a meal deal or a combo meal for a single price then we have products treated within the meal deal at different VAT rates. And the consideration received, the, the selling price, needs to be apportioned by the taxpayer to take account of the different VAT rates applying to each constituent part of the meal. So on this slide, we have you know, a pretty common meal deal sold for, um, that, that is often sold for a single all-in price, a burger, fries, and a soft drink. Next slide, please, Sarah. But whereas the burger and fries, the hot, a hot takeaway food element does attract the reduced rate, which would be 12.5% from, from the 1st of October. The cold takeaway beverage retains its normal VAT liability, which is still 20%. So this means that if you're charging a single price for the meal deal, say £3.50, then that consideration needs to be apportioned so that the correct amount of VAT has been calculated. And the way that's normally carried out is by reference to selling price, whereby in, in this example, the three individual items within the meal deal, um, you take the um, a proportion of the total selling price and then work out the VAT that was due um, using the original selling price so that the original selling price is a proportion of the meal deal selling price and calculate the VAT um, from there and the resulting average or blended VAT rate could then be programmed into the business's EPOS or TIL system so that the correct amount of VAT is calculated on the transaction. So businesses in this sector that do this sort of thing are going to need to start preparing now for the rate change um, that takes place on the 1st of October. Next slide, please. This can lead to additional complications as well. So delivery charges, for instance, on takeaway food, they will, or delivery charges generally, follow the VAT treatment of the, um, of the goods that are being delivered. So if you've got a, um, a meal that's been delivered with you know, a blended VAT rate that isn't, you know, that's had to be apportioned to come up with a blended VAT rate, then the delivery charge arguably shouldn't just be at 20%. It will need to be apportioned as well. We've come across problems as well um, in arrangements that retailers, um, restaurants, takeaway establishments have with online food and delivery platforms. And this is because often the, 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 the platform will issue an invoice on the um, on, on the restaurant or um, business's behalf um, to the customer. And what we've identified is that the VAT often being shown on the invoice by the online delivery platform doesn't actually reflect the VAT that the, um, the retailer, or the caterer is accounting for on the supply. There's, a, there's, there's often a mismatch, um, which, can obviously be problematic, particularly if the invoice issued by the online platform is for as shows more VAT on it than 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 has been accounted for by the business. And there are additional problems with also treatment of gift vouchers. Obviously, gift out gift vouchers that have already been redeemed, but they're going to that have already been issued, but they're going to be redeemed after the 30th of September. 
VAT at the, um, if it's a multi-purpose voucher, the VAT at the new reduced rate of 12.5% will need to be accounted for. Next slide, please. So a further um, COVID-related change, a COVID-related measure, um, um, HMRC has made two important announcements about its policy concerning um, the notification of the options tax on land and buildings. You may recall that HMRC extended the time limit for notifying an option to tax to 90 days from the date the option was made for any option to tax decisions made between 15th of February 2020 and the 31st of July 2021. So that relief has now ended. So for option to tax decisions made from the 1st of August this year on London buildings, uh, businesses need to notify those options to HMRC within the normal time limit of 30 days for them to be effective. Um, the second change HMRC announced relates to um, during the pandemic, HMRC allowed businesses um, to uh, or their agents to notify an option to tax with um, an electronic signature rather than a, a wet signature sent into HMRC. Um, but conditional on providing supplementary evidence of, of being properly authorised to um, to provide that signature. And that change has now been made permanent by HMRC. Next slide, please, Sarah. Still on COVID-19 um, related measures, um, HMRC has now issued a brief or recently issued a brief, that's a Revenue Customers Brief 11 this year, um, giving a detailed explanation on the VAT treatment of COVID-19 testing services, which are now supplied by a variety of providers and by different methods. Um, the brief seems to have been prompted by recent media articles questioning um, inconsistencies in the VAT position of the various suppliers of these tests. For example, selling COVID tests to um, UK and overseas travellers. Um, the key point arising from the brief is that COVID-19 testing can only be treated as medical care and therefore as exempt if it involves administration of the actual test to a patient and the provision of the results by a medical profession. And this includes where such activity is supervised by a medical professional. So if your business is involved in COVID-19 testing at all, it'll be worth closely examining the context of what contents of what was quite a detailed brief to ensure that your own services are being treated correctly. Next slide, please, Sarah. Change attack now completely. Um, we're going to take a closer look at one of the main schemes that has been introduced by the EU as a result of its VAT package for EU, com EU commerce that was implemented from the 1st of July this year. Next slide, please. As everyone listening will be aware, um, the UK became a third country on the 1st of January, now sits outside the EU bloc and also outside the EU's distance selling regime. And since that date, um, I think it's fair to say that it's been problematic for businesses in Great Britain to send consignments and parcels from Great Britain to private consumers in the EU. And that's principally as a result of import back and customs duty now being in the supply chain. One of the main changes of the EU VAT package introduced on the 1st of July was to make things even worse and to abolish low value consign the low value consignment exemption for imports into the EU of 22 euros or less. So this means that all commercial imports into the EU now sent from GB or from other third countries um, all commercial imports are now subject to import VAT regardless of their value unless the EU import one-stop shop is used to relieve the goods of import VAT. Next slide please. So what's the import one-stop shop and what's its purpose? Well it's basically a voluntary scheme that's been created by the EU to facilitate and simplify the declaration and payment of VAT on distant sales of imported goods from outside of the EU, but with a consignment value 
not exceeding 150 euros um, and not for goods which are subject to excise good excise duty um, so in summary sellers need to apply that um, at the online checkout and selling goods destined for a customer in an EU member state the VAT rate applicable to the goods will be the one applicable in the EU member state where the goods are to be, to be delivered um, the online seller will be required to show the amount of VAT to be paid um, by the end customer at the online checkout um, total price payable including VAT should also be shown on the customer's invoice um, and the scheme involves a single IRSS import one-stop registration in an EU member state and that registration is then valid or covers all distant sales of imported goods made to EU customers up to that consignment value of 150 euros and a single monthly VAT return is then submitted to um, the tax authority in which the business is registered the member state um, member state tax authority in which the business is registered via um, that that territory's import one-stop shop portal um, and then submitted to the tax is then submitted to that local tax authority which then presumably shares that tax out amongst the different EU tax authorities next slide please so what are the benefits of the import one-stop shop for GB retailers well it it covers all B2C imports up to 150 euros no import or VAT no import VAT or customs duty up to 150 euros that 150 euro threshold is the intrinsic value of the commercial goods so it excludes any VAT customs charges transport insurance costs one of the big benefits is that customs can clearance customs clearance can take place in any EU member state which if you're using a variety of fast parcel carriers who clear goods in different territories that can be also a big advantage it means no EU EURI number will be required for consignments 150 euros and the, the underlying principle one of the key things the EU um, look, look to achieve by introducing this scheme is faster release of faster release of goods through EU customs which results in faster delivery times the so-called green lane treatment so in principle you know a good a consignment a parcel imported into the EU 150 euros shouldn't get any you know shouldn't hold be held up should get the green lane treatment and fly through customs much more quickly than a parcel or consignment um, where the seller hasn't got an import one-stop shop number um, it should in principle result in better price transparency for EU customers there's a single monthly VAT return for all sales to all EU customers no matter which member state they're in and it should in principle simplify logistics and in principle reduce compliance costs next slide slide please Sarah what about the disadvantages of the scheme well non-eu established gb or non-eu established and gb sellers still currently are required to appoint an eu intermediary both to register for the scheme and file their VAT returns and pay their tax um, so and that intermediary needs to be a taxable person established in the eu and there's there's obviously a cost associated with that you know a charge to be made for businesses that um, register for the scheme are not established and have to register for the scheme via an intermediary and that intermediary intermediary is jointly and severally liable for the tax so and you know some intermediaries are reflecting that fact in the charges that they make another disadvantage is which has always been a disadvantage really it's not one really related to the iss is that there are different vat rates across the eu so you know gb businesses are still having to um, deal with selling consignments to customers in different jurisdictions with different VAT rates um, and apply the VAT rate where the customer is located and then probably the biggest drawback of the scheme is that it's only 150 euro threshold so lots of consignments lots of GP sellers sell goods into the EU over that consignment and can't use therefore the IOSS for those consignments which means they still have to work out 
how to deal with import VAT particularly, uh, um, and as well as customs duties potentially on goods that they send into the EU by either making the customer the import of record or having a local VAT registration. Next slide, please. So this is what the IOSS return looks like. Um, this is a, a screenshot from the Irish Tax Authority's website, um, identical to the EU One Stop Shop return, which is a different beast. Um, and you know, it's worth saying that you know registration for the IOSS is pretty quick and easy. Businesses, when they register, will get the IOSS number within um, within a few days normally, and the IOSS return itself is fairly straightforward. Um, there's not that many data fields to complete. Um, I think it's about six data fields. Record keeping is also relatively easy. You know, I think there's only 12 data fields that need to be kept for record retention purposes, although records do need to be kept under the scheme for a period of 10 years. As you can see from this screenshot, if you look at the drop down menu, um, there's a drop down menu for each EU member state and then you plug in the tax amount, supply, VAT rate, etc. On this snapshot, the member state is Northern Ireland, which leads nicely on to the next slide, please. So Northern Ireland is still in the EU for the purposes of goods and low value consignment relief, that 22 euro threshold was only removed there on the 1st of July. Um, but consignment sent from consignment sent from GB into the EU into Northern Ireland at the moment um, from GB are still not subject to having to complete a customs declaration, and there's no import VAT currently on consignments valued at or under 135 pounds that are going into Northern Ireland. Simplified declaration still required for consignments over that value. But the interesting thing is that. If you're a GB business and you're registered for the import one-stop shop because you're sending consignments from GB into the EU, um, if you make sales to Northern Ireland customers, then HMRC are asking taxpayers to pay the VAT over on those sales on the IOSS return rather than on the UK stroke GB VAT return. So if you decide to register for the IOSS and you're going to make supplies to customers in Northern Ireland or the goods leave GB to go into Northern Ireland, then that VAT can be paid over or should be paid over now on the IOSS return rather than the normal VAT return. Next slide, please. So how's it going so far? Well, registration's quick and easy. IOSS numbers received very quickly. Um, businesses, though, as well as having their own websites and their own IOSS number, they might sell goods via Amazon, via eBay. So they might be dealing with more than one IOSS number. Um, you know, they'll use the platform's IOSS number send, to send goods into the EU. So there's that complication. Um, the freight companies and fast parcel carriers are still really adapting to um, to the IOSS. You know, they're still asking businesses you know, for INCO terms, whether it's DDU or DDP, um, and there's no option sometimes of an IOSS number, which, you know, that's going to take some time to bed down, but is obviously causing difficulties. Um, and that there's been a relatively low take up of the IOSS to date. So in Ireland, which is one of the most, the Republic of Ireland, which is one of the most popular territories for GB businesses to register for the IOSS, um, they've still had I think of, as of last week, only about 700-ish IOSS registrations. Um, so, um, and the reason the tax authorities think that the take-up has been so low is a fear of backdated assessments. Um, so that they register for it and perhaps should have been registered previously. They're concerned that, um, you know, they're going to be subject to, to back assessments from tax authorities if they register for the IOSS. Um, there's still a lack of intermediaries to choose from. Um, there's some very, very good ones out there, but there's still a lack of intermediaries. Um, and that's partly because of the joint and several, li several liability issue. You know, the agent's also on the hook for any tax that's due. Um, and um, 
there's still concern over number security as well um, you know because the EU tax authorities I don't think many member states yet are set up to actually check that um, you know ISS numbers are valid and actually belong to the person that's uh, declaring the goods um, and there's also problems over the difference between the intrinsic value of the goods for the purposes of IOSS and the customs value of the goods around that 150 euro limit. So there's lots of teething problems and it's been a probably from the EU's perspective quite a slow start. But we think the IOSS, despite the threshold limit, is, is still quite a promising scheme and should be looked at by GB, certainly be considered by GB retailers, any GB retailer sending consignments into the EU. Um, and as the, as the infrastructure evolves around the scheme and the EU tweak it, we think that uh, we think that, that, it, that the way the scheme works at the moment will certainly improve. That's all from me. I'll now hand you over to Sarah Holstead. Thank you, Pete. Um, right, well, let's move on with an uh, an update from HMRC on its controversial new policy on early termination fees and compensation payments. Um, so just to remind you what this is all about, HMRC has historically accepted that payments described as compensation were typically outside the scope of VAT because they're not consideration for any supply of goods or services. Its view on this has been narrowing though over the last two or three years um, and in um, 2019 we saw HMRC impose VAT on retained deposits, for example on cancelled hotel room bookings and leisure activities. Last autumn HMRC went even further by issuing a business brief that announced a new VAT policy on early termination fees and compensation payments which was based on some recent European court decisions. Um, examples of what HMRC means by early termination fees include fees charged to customers who end mobile phone contracts early or their TV and broadband subscription contracts early or um, vehicle finance leases before the end of the contractual period. HMRC believes that penalty charges levied by providers on customers are actually subject to VAT, even if they're described as compensation or damages in the small print. Um, for compensation payments in general, HMRC says that these are only VAT free if they have no direct link to a supply of goods or services. And um, this part of the new policy was quite loosely worded with very few examples. So we feared that many types, other types of compensation in um, multiple sectors could be dragged into the VAT net by this um, new policy. Also, to make matters worse, HMRC said it was going to apply this change retrospectively, meaning that businesses potentially had to account for VAT on these payments received in the last four years. Now that led to many complaints from businesses and tax advisors because it contradicted HMRC's usual practice, which is not to apply European court judgments retrospectively. Um, stakeholders are also upset because right up to the day that the brief came out, HMRC's guidance on its website said that compensation payments were usually not subject to that, only to change suddenly with retrospective effect. There was also particular concern in the marketplace about the um, position of dilapidation payments that are related to land and property leaflets, uh, leases. Um, these are payments that arise when the terms of the lease require the tenant to return the property to the landlord at the end of the lease in the same condition as when it was first occupied. If they don't, then the landlord has the right to charge the tenants for the cost of restoring the property to the required condition. And HMRC seemed to be taking the position that these payments, which it had previously considered to be outside the scope of VAT, should actually follow the VAT liability of the lease. So a dilapidation payment on a lease with an option to tax would be subject to VAT at 20%, and that would be a change from its previous policy. So in face of this of, um, quite strong reaction from stakeholders, um, HMRC agreed in January 2021 that it would delay the mandatory implementation of the policy while it reconsidered these points. HMRC also said at that point that it had decided not to impose um, the new interpretation retrospectively after all. Instead, it would come into force from a later date once the revised policy has been finalised and published. 
And in the interim period, HMRC said that businesses could choose whether to apply the new policy in the business brief or go back to treating them as outside the scope of that until HMRC confirms its uh, revised policy. So that's where HMRC has left the businesses that are affected by this for now while it's working on this behind the scenes. Um, so if we fast forward to August 2021 and HMRC released a draft of its new guidance to selected stakeholders for comment. It's um, firstly, it's very important to stress that HMRC has said that this is a draft and it's not necessarily its final view. So the position on this could change again before the final guidance is released. Um, but the main point emerging from this draft is that HMRC appears to have decided that VAT will not apply to property dilapidation payments. It looks like it's going to maintain its previous policy of treating them as outside the scope of VAT. So that is good news. But otherwise, the draft suggests that HMRC is pretty much sticking to its guns on the broader issues, recompensation and termination fees. So in the future, businesses can exp expect a climate where HMRC is going to be looking to link compensation payments to a taxable supply of goods as much as they can and um, expecting VAT to be accounted for. HMRC hasn't yet given us a revised implementation uh, date for its new policy, but we would expect that to be confirmed by HMRC at the time that it publishes the finalised guidance. So we're currently waiting for HMRC to publicly confirm its position, which looks like it's not too far away now. Um, I also suspect that the effective date of the new policy will either be the date that the revised guidance appears on the gov.uk website or very shortly afterwards. Um, so businesses will probably not get much lead time to work out how to put this into practice. Um, so really now is a good time to check whether your business receives payments that might be described as compensation or damages and how you've treated them for that purposes. In the front line for this, I'd say are the telecoms and technology sectors and also the travel, leisure and hospitality sectors. But it could potentially apply to any business that makes this kind of penalty charge to its customers. And it's also advisable to review the wording of your contracts and the terms and conditions to make sure you have a correct and optimum VAT position in place ready for where HMRC's new policy comes into force. OK, so that's the end of our scheduled presentations for today. Uh, let's move on to uh, look at some of the, uh, the questions that have come in over the last hour. And uh, I'm just going to leave this slide up um, so you, uh, while we're talking, just so you can see how to submit any more questions that you might have. Um, OK, so uh, to get us started off, I, I have a question for you, Jim. Um, the question is, has there been any follow up announcements from HMRC regarding its position following the Royal Opera House decision? Oh, thank you. Thanks for the questioner. Uh, not that we're aware of so far. Um, we have had no uh, announcements by way of, of a business brief uh, from HMRC. It may be in, in train in a sense. We just have to wait and see. But at the moment, we know that the Court of Appeal decision was based on that decision uh, and that should inform, it, inform taxpayers as it stands at the moment. But not yet, I think that's that, Sarah. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jim. Uh, we've got another question for Pete, which is about the import one-stop shop. Um, and the question is, will the EU always expect UK businesses to register for the import one-stop shop through a representative, or is this a just a Brexit teething problem? Oh, um, what a good question. Um, we know that HMRC is confirmed that it's in negotiation with the EU over whether this intermediary requirement can be waived. Um, and we think that's under the terms of the, the you know, the, the GB EU de deal and the mutual assistance agreement um, that was recently agreed. Um, there's no guarantee, I guess, that the EU will agree, but it's, it, it, it's on HMRC's agenda. Um, so it's a possibility. Um, and, you know, certainly, I mean, you've got the Northern Ireland aspect as well. It seems bizarre that, you know, 
um, if you only made um, sales into sales into Northern Ireland but wanted to register for the scheme, they'd have to appoint an intermediary. You know, given you're a GB business, it's just a bit bonkers. So, I, I my view is that it will be relaxed and that at some point soon GB businesses won't need to appoint an EU intermediary. But you know, lots of businesses have already appointed one and incurred lots of costs doing it. Um, and I know quite a few intermediaries that, you know, have, um, you know, set up infrastructure and all the rest of it to, to, uh, to deal with this, um, to deal with acting as an intermediary and costs have been incurred. So, I mean, it really it should have been dealt with at the outset, frankly. Um, but, you know, as with, as with anything Brexit related, things could change. So yeah, watch this space, I guess. Okay, thanks very much, Pete. Um, right, we have another question for you, Pete, on the import one-stop shop. And the question is, is it safe to presume that a US company would have the same issues with IOS as a GB company would? Yeah, exactly the same. So if you're a US online business and the consignments into the EU, if you don't register, if you don't get an IOSS number, don't register for the iOS, then any consignments that you send in to the EU under 150 euros, the entire consignment value will be subject to import VAT. Um, I guess potentially custom duty, I don't know, probably not custom duty, but it certainly be subject to, to import VAT. So, you know, the iOSS, it's not, you know, it's not just for G business, GB businesses, any online seller, in any territory outside the EU can you can register and use the scheme for consignments of 150 euros that are being imported to private consumers in the EU um, and the, the benefits and advantages of the scheme are the same for a US business as they are for a for a UK for a UK business GB business um, I mean you know there are there are technical difficulties with the scheme you know you can't use it for excise goods you can't use it for zero rated goods but i think overall it's you know it's it, it it's it's a helpful uh, relief that the eu have in, in, introduced you wish the threshold was higher but you know that, that's their decision i have us clients that sell things like such as vitamins into eu customers and they have set the basket on their online website website at 150 euros so that you can't you know you've, you can't go over that value um, you can probably order more on the website and have separate consignments but they've limited the basket value to 150 euros so that um, um, you know to stay within the OSS so they're not incurring any costs on on parcels or consignments over that value so you know it's you can practically work around it and deal with it and there are there are, there are ways of sending goods into the EU for consignment values over that value. Um, um, so, you know, it's just the same advantages and disadvantages, no matter which territory you're in, I think. Okay, thank you for that, Pete. Um, I have another query that perhaps you're also in the, uh, the best position to answer. Um, the question is, uh, do you have any experience of dealing with express carriers who aren't making declarations when uh, shipping goods to Northern Ireland, despite the goods being valued at more than one hundred and thirty-five pounds, and uh, they are denying the need to do this. I don't know if this is something that you've spotted out there in the marketplace. I I, I don't have personal experience, but I mean the, the Northern Ireland protocol is very messy and mired in politics, um, and it would not surprise me that that is happening, to be honest. Um, I, you know, there will be change to the protocol, um, no doubt about it, I think over the next 12, 18 months, uh, there could be good, could be bad changes. Um, I did get a little bit concerned when clients started being told by HMRC that if they were registered for the IOSS that they would have to pay VAT on consignment sent to Northern Ireland on their IOSS return rather than on their UK VAT return. I sort of got this inkling feeling that perhaps there was some unwelcome changes coming in respect of the protocol in respect of parcels under 135 euros, uh, pounds, pounds sterling, sorry. 
you know, it's not inconceivable that the protocols toughened up and that, you know, that parcels going in to Northern Ireland will be subject to import that unless the IOSS is used. That could be further down the line. Um, but as it is at the moment, it doesn't surprise me that that's happening at all. If I could maybe just uh, make a comment, Pete, if you don't mind. I think what we're seeing is, is an awful lot of interaction between the logistics teams uh, in our clients with their uh, carriers and agents, and there is some disparity in treatment depending on the particular route to which goods move across a border, the value which is applied to those goods when they move across border, and the processes and procedures that are in place, either depending which country uh, border you're crossing or which uh, regime you're subject to. So uh, we are experiencing a lot of disparity, I think, in treatment. Is that fair to say, Pete? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a mess. <laughs> Okay, um, we have another question, which I think is one for me. And the question is, as a housing association, we pay compensation to our tenants for home loss and disturbance. We treat these payments as outside the scope of VAT. Would there be any difference in the treatment of compensation paid similar to compensation charged? Um, well, I think the answer to that is that firstly, HMRC so far has been quite vague about what compensation it's, it intends to apply that to in the future. It's uh, all very loosely worded and uh, indistinct. Um, what it has said that might be helpful for this query is that it's trying to link the, the payment to an underlying um, supply of um, uh, taxable services. Uh, and one example that it's given in the draft guidance is um, if somebody hires a car and gets a penalty for hiring the car for an extra two days without authorization, not bringing it back on time, then um, HMRC is saying that that would essentially be um, the uh, the extension of, of the hire and that would be a vatable supply and it's subject to VAT. But if somebody um, had to pay a compensation payment to the hire company um, for writing off the car and seriously damaging it, then that's not really something that um, was supposed to happen under the contract. So HMRC would think that that wasn't um, vatable. Uh, and perhaps the same um, might apply to this situation. Um, if it's for home loss and disturbance uh, that sort of lies outside the the main lease, then it might be that HMRC won't see that as vatable compensation. But um, we are still in the situation of uncertainty. HMRC hasn't yet issued its final guidance. Even when it does, there is still going to be um, quite a lot of grey areas we'd anticipate. So it's probably something to take a close look at um, uh, in, in, and perhaps um, review your individual circumstances. Okay, let's see if we've got any more questions. Uh, okay, um, I think actually that's probably all we have time for today. Um, if we haven't got to your question, what we do is we'll respond um, to you by email in the next few days. Um, our next uh, webinar is going to be on the 25th of November 2021. So if you want to uh, register for that, do get in touch with us and we'll send you some more information. Um, also, if you'd like to receive regular VAT updates from RSM, you can join our VAT group on LinkedIn. Um, just uh, log into LinkedIn and then search for RSM's uh, VAT group and there it is. And uh, finally, if you want to um, join um, more RSM webinars and events, you can sign up on our preference page, uh, which you can find via the link that's on the screen here. It's rsmuk.com preferences. And uh, you can give us your details and we'll let you know when our next webinars are happening. So uh, that is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for your participation. We'll get back to any un unanswered questions afterwards and we hope to see you on the next webinar in November.